before you're seated this morning. Amen. God is good today. You may be seated. I appreciate the goodness of God and the mercy of God and especially the grace of God. How about you? He's good to us, as I heard one guy say, better than I deserve. And probably all of us would fit that category that God is better to us than we deserve. Today I want to begin a series of sermons, and this will be the introduction that uh, will help us get into that. It is my plan, if the Lord wills, and I believe that He is. And I want to begin a teaching on uh, praying in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I will set the stage for that today and give us some reasons why. And will encourage you to do some things on your own that will help and aid as we preach the sermons, as this series of sermons. I think it's important that we learn how to pray. Amen? Amen? I think it's important that we learn the right way. Uh, because, to be honest, probably 95% of our prayers are spent on ourselves. And that's not really uh, what he had in mind. Uh, it's okay to pray for yourself, but it cannot be the bulk of our praying. There's a lot of pressing needs that need our attention in this world. Amen? Amen? And today, I want to use as a subject thought, Dark Prince Rising. And we'll get into that in a little while. Paul tells us this, that in the last days, perilous times and perilous men will come. I believe that they will be driven by a demonic spirit as the adversary, the devil, makes a last-ditch effort to stop the work of God and the power of God. Paul also said that some would creep in among us. We don't believe that stuff anymore. And that some from our own ranks would begin to rise up within us. Now, Paul said that. And he said that it would draw away many. These who would be, would weaken the word of God. And, and, and cause the keys of the truth to stop being preached. It is the reason we see so many unbiblical things going on in the church today. That's not biblical. I think God has a problem when we add extracurricular activity to what he's already penned. And contrary to popular belief, God is not writing another Bible. As some are saying, he's writing something new. No, he's not. He may be enforcing what is already there. But he's not writing any new scripture. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 through 17, this is what the Bible says. All Scripture. Now, how many of you know what the Greek definition of all is? All. <laughs> there you go. Pretty smart bunch here today. All is all. That means all of the Scripture that has been written is written by the inspiration of the living God. 
The word inspiration means breath of God. In other words, all that you're reading in the Bible, God breathed it out and man wrote it down. Simple thing. He was just taking dictation. That's all the prophets were doing was just dictating what God was downloading. We should be familiar with that, downloading and uploading and all the other loadings that you go on with computers. We should be equipped with that. But the Bible says all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable. It is profitable for doctrine, right things, for reproof, for telling you you're wrong. Church members do not like to hear they're wrong. Nobody likes to hear they're wrong. Ask 20 people on the street if they like hearing they're wrong. No one will answer the affirmative. For correction, when you're not doing things correctly, we always have, a, have something like, but I thought, but I believe. Do you know you're not going to be judged on what you believe about the Bible? You're going to be judged on how you believe and practice the Bible. What you believe about it, it's not going to be that important for you. For instruction in righteousness. That's what the Word of God is good for. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work and every assignment that God might add to us. If we will stay in the Word of God, read the Word of God, we will be thoroughly, absolutely equipped to do what God has called us to do. All Scripture is profitable for us. God has designed us to be the door kickers and the devil chasers. We are designed to be keepers and proclaimers of the truth. We are living in a spiritual war zone, which in many places has gone dark. No longer, is the enemy, no longer are we blaming the enemy as the culprit. We are dealing more with social justice than we are dealing with righteousness and judgment. Now, you're going to have to stay with me on this. This is introduction. This nation was founded on the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. America, whether you know it or not, is the longest standing form of government in the world today. And we're about 200 years, about two, 150 years past a collapse. We should have collapsed 150 years ago, but there's a reason we didn't. It's because this country was founded on the principles of God. Regardless of what they may be teaching in the universities and what you can find online, if you read good doctrine and if you read good history, you will find that out. Our system of government has stood for a long time. The devil knows this and has been slowly raising up a force to deal with this. You see, the adversary is alone. He was there when they landed at Plymouth Rock. He was there when they made a declaration. We found this nation on the principles and the propagation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was there when that was said, just like he was there in the garden when Adam and Eve was there, just like he was there when they had everything and lost everything. He was there, and he was there and has been there through the forming of every nation in the world. And when America was formed, he was there listening to the proclamation that was made. This nation shall be a nation under God. The devil knows and has been ra slowly raising up a force to deal with those who would name the name of Jesus and follow the book. I never thought I would see some of the things that I'm seeing on television these days and here on the news. It's like, oh, my world, am, am I living in an altered universe? Is this a dream? If it is, please wake up because I'm not liking what I'm seeing. Let's just ride a while and see what will happen. The writers of the Scripture under the inspiration of God knew this and penned it for you and I to learn from. And we ought to be learning from that. Amen? It is easy to see that our nation's in trouble. If you look around, it's easy to see that there's some not-so-nice things happening. It's thing, bad things are happening in our cities and our schools. How would you like to live in Chicago this morning? Or some of those cities, that's right, brother, who <laughs> know? 
I wouldn't want to live there or anywhere else in the big city because of all that is happening there. Do you think that that's pleasing to the Lord? What do you suppose is happening in those cities? What is the problem of this? They, the government is telling us guns are the problem. No, guns are not the problem. I own many guns, and none of them have done anything illegal. Every one of them have been behaved all the 40 years that I've owned them. They've not misbehaved one time. People are what kills people, and people are driven by a spirit, either God's spirit or the adversary's spirit, but we don't believe those things anymore. In our schools, in our government, in our communities, even in our churches, to where unbiblical things are preached, a tactic of the enemy because he knows what the Bible declares about truth. John 8, 31 and 32 then Jesus said to those Jews who believed, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. It is the truth of God that gives us our identity. It is the truth of God that sets us free from the things that the enemy binds us with. When we read it in the word and we understand that this is for me, we can have those things. There is a dark prince that's rising, and we're going to address him today in what I see happening and what I hear that is happening. But first, we need to read through a few things. If I were the devil, the one thing I would want to stop there, well, I'd actually be two things. I'd want to stop the truth being preached across the pulpits, and I would want to stop any and all advocacy for the baptism of the Holy Ghost with praying in other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. Those are two things I would not want to happen. And brothers and sisters, that is exactly what is happening. Pastors are declaring across their pulpit what the Bible says is an abomination. I know we don't like hearing straight old-fashioned preaching, but I'm an old guy. That's what you get out of us. We need to understand what the Scripture is trying to say to us, that these things are happening, and the enemy doesn't want truth preached or the Holy Spirit poured out. He would love to hold that, but the good news and bad news, the bad news is he's succeeding in some areas, but the good news is he will never completely succeed. Truth is not always comfortable, is it? How many of you have friends that will tell you the truth? Yeah, it's about two of you raised, three of you raised your hand. rest of you have friends that lie to you. Does this make me look fat? No, you look beautiful. <laughs> but that's not what they're thinking in their mind. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't get the stones out or write any unkind words to me. What is truth? Truth is what God's Word says it is. Truth is what the Bible says it is, not what I say it is. What can help us in our desperate times? Here's what I believe and I perceive from the Holy Spirit that we need in these last times. We need a Holy Ghost revival, a revival that brings back holiness and decency and joy and peace, a revival that causes us to love everybody, a revival that unites us once again. Right now, the devil's doing all he can to divide us over race, over economics, over our point of view. You know, well, if you, never mind. We need a revival that will cause our nation to seek him again. There are those who say this cannot happen, but I absolutely believe that if the church will begin to call on the name of the Lord because of the precedence in Scripture, when God's people cried, God responded. Always he responded. Always he came to the rescue. Always he sent an angel. Always he sent healing. Always he did something to help them out of the place they were. It is replete throughout Scripture, and we need to know that. So if we call... God will respond, and I am so pleased to see so many people calling on the name of the Lord in this church. There are those that meet at 5 o'clock and those that meet at midnight and those that meet on Sundays and those that meet through the week all over this church every week calling on the name of the Lord. That cannot help but make a difference. 
We must recognize what we're dealing with. It's not a Democratic Party or a Republican Party, but a sin problem. It is a problem that is driven by demonic force. Ephesians chapter 6. Before I read this, I want to quantify. The devil would like, and a lot of preachers are helping him, to say that all of that stuff don't exist anymore. <laughs> well, if all of that stuff doesn't exist anymore, neither does salvation, neither does the Holy Spirit, because we needed the Holy Spirit to combat those kind of things. He didn't send the Holy Spirit so you could feel goosebumps or speak in tongues. He sent them so you would have power. Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power, power to deal with junk, and not all of it personal. I mean, could I say this? When you get saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, there comes a point when you need to be the leader of your life and let Jesus Christ be the head of you and stop going around the same mountain every week or two. I got this problem. I get freedom from it for till I'm here. I pick it up again on my way around, and I carry it, and I get delivered here. And then I go around, and I pick it up again. Stop doing that. Here's why you have the Holy Spirit. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Listen to me. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. I want you to understand every one of those words is in the plural principalities we deal with a lot of principalities over this nation over our cities and even over your community that you live in you think the enemy doesn't have a hierarchy God has one and so does the enemy where do you think he learned it he was an angel he was a part of it principalities powers Rulers, hosts. All of that hierarchy we are dealing with in this spiritual, in this world that we live in. All of these things you and I are dealing with. They have set up kingdoms in the spiritual realm and are causing a great havoc on the earth. Well, Pastor, I don't know if I can believe that. It's okay. I'll help you hopefully before we end the sermon. The word palaty, a palaty is a city. A principality is a prince over a city or a region. So divide the world up in all of the map that it is, and somebody did that for us. They separated the countries. They did that in the Bible, by the way, so it's okay. They separated the countries, and there's a principality over this and a principality over that and a principality over that because the God of this world, who is the devil, assures there is. And if we're not careful, we tend to not understand what that's saying. But the Bible clearly says that, and I can, I'm going to prove that in both the Old and the New Testament. We live in a spiritual war zone where the enemy uses many tactics in his attempt to defeat you individually and corporately. Listen, when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, everything that you need to live spiritually whole was provided for. The only issue is we need to appropriate that. In other words, we need to go into the Lord and say, Lord, I want to incorporate that into my life, and he allows us to do that. We see a picture of principalities in Daniel and in Mark. And let's look at Daniel first. Daniel chapter 10, verse 12, uh, 12 through 21. Then he said to me, do not fear. Let me set the stage for those who may not under know what this really means. This is where Daniel had been praying and fasting for 21 days about leaving Babylon. The seven years of oppression was up, and he's praying. He's been fasting for 21 days, and an angel of the Lord come to him and touched him. Now, whether you believe it or not, there are angels happening all over the place. There's heavenly angels and demonic angels, and they're here, and they're among us, and that is the, the way life is. Then he said, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words, in other words, your prayers were heard, and I have come because of your words. 
This is Michael the archangel talking to him, said, I am come because you prayed. You prayed, and I came. In fact, God's saying, I sent two angels. The first one could not get through. But, but because you kept praying, I sent Michael, the archangel. So let's read a little bit. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Persia was a nation that had a prince over it. How do you know it wasn't just a prince like a king? Because an angel had come, and no human can stand in the face of an angel. So therefore, I understand that is a demonic force. That is a prince over Persia. But it could be a prince over America. It could be a prince over your town or over your city or over one of the nations of the world or one of the towns or the states of this country. Believe me, the enemy wants to get a prince over that so he can influence governmental issues. Boy, we got some crazy stuff, haven't we? Have you been following some of this nutty stuff? It's like, what planet are we living on? It can't be Earth. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia would stood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief prince, came to help me. For I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet not to come. When he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. And suddenly one having the likeness of the Son of God touched my lips and I opened my mouth and, and spoke saying to me, who stood before him, My Lord, because of the vision of my sorrows have overwhelmed me, and I have retained no strength. For now this servant of the, my Lord talk with you. My Lord, as for me, no strength remains in me, nor in any breath left in me. Then again, the one having the likeness of the man of God touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let the word speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, do you not know why I have come to you, and now I must return and fight? Listen, that angel said, I've come to you, but i got to return because i got a fight going on over here, and I'm going back and fighting. That's what's happening in the atmosphere right now. You may not be able to see that, but that's what's happening. Same thing that was happening with Daniel is happening today. Don't let it freak you out. There's some more good stuff coming. Listen to what he said. And now I must return to fight with the king of per the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. Persia, Greece is over here. That, that spirit's coming too. That prince is coming too. They're fixing to get into it with me. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture true. No one opposed me against thee except Michael, your prince. Did you know that you have a prince? Do you know who your prince is this morning? Your prince is Jesus Christ. He is the prince of peace. He is the power of the resurrection. He is joy. He is all the things that you and I need to serve God. He is all of those things. You have a prince. From this we can see the devil has designed princes over cities and regions and countries to destroy the word of God and the works of God. We see this in the New Testament. In Mark chapter 5, verse 8 through 11. He said to me, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered, my name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. A legion there means 6,000. A Roman legion was 6,000. So what this demon was saying to Jesus is that there are 6,000 demons living here and we're dealing with all of this region. And please, we beg you, don't send us out of this country. Why do you suppose they want to, it's okay, rebuke us, just leave us in this country. Just leave us here. Leave us here because here we have influence. Here we have a, a lot of things going on. Do you think that it was about the pigs that caused the people to ask Jesus to leave? You really think it was about pigs? wasn't about pigs. It was about freedom. It was about if, this, if these demons stay in this area, they will continue the influence over this region. The hierarchy was there. There was a prince that spoke out of that man, and then all of these others were there to accompany him. 
And they were there to keep that bound. Jesus asked the man, who are you? He said, I'm legion. I'm a lot of us. There are 6,000 of us living here. Please do not send us. There's a lot in that message. That demon recognized that Jesus had the power to deal with 6,000 of them at one time. Do you hear what I'm telling you? 6,000 did not bother Jesus. 100,000, 100 million would not have bothered him. They just used a legion. But none of them can influence him or stop him. And we need to understand that we are living in an area of life right now when these princes are very active on planet Earth. They've always been here from the Old Testament in the New Testament. Now, if I were to take a survey, and it would be okay to raise your hands if I ask this question. How many of you still believe those kind of scriptures where there are princes and demonic rulers over areas of the earth? About 50%. The enemy loves that. He loves to keep us to where we don't understand. I don't know if I can believe that. It's in the Bible. I mean, are you saying God's a liar? I mean, I'm just reading this stuff to you. It's not my idea. I didn't write any of that. Paul wrote that. God inspired that. Paul was taking dictation as the Holy Spirit stood behind him and whispered to him, Write this, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, more than one, against rulers, against powers, against hosts. All over the place, we deal with those things. They asked Jesus to leave the community. But I don't really think it was about pigs. I think it was about power. I think it was about we have this region sewed up. I mean, you got Jews raising pigs. Think about that. You know, we read that and it doesn't bother us just a little bit, but think about that. That's, 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 not, that's taboo. They don't do that. They don't eat pork. A whole lot was going on there. Satan has been building strongholds in our nations for years. But we can come against the strongholds in prayer. Satan is opposing the First Amendment right now. Freedom of speech. You better be careful what you say. They will cancel you. Freedom of the press. Some books they will not release nor publish. Freedom of religion. Freedom to assemble. Shut all churches in America. Play football and basketball and baseball but shut the church. Because surely in all of these places where men are sweating and grabbing each other and breathing in each other's face and screaming and spitting, you won't get a virus there. But if you go sing, you're apt to catch one. Do you really think it was about that? No. It's about shutting down these things. Um, I'm going to break some research out just for a little bit to help us understand because I want to tell you what the strong man that I see rising in our nation today. And I keep up with what's happening. I try to stay abreast with all that's happening in the news. And I realize that you can't always believe a news guy, and I don't. I do a little research on my own to find things so that I will understand. But what I see rising is a spirit of socialism. Socialism is a cruel taskmaster. And the enemy's done a very good job of hiding what's going on in the nation of America today. They took a survey. 59% of Americans were opposed to their using the term socialism, but 83% was okay with using the term progressive. The, the devil just changed the word. It's the same doctrine. Study it the same doctrine but he he listens to the polls he lets Gallup take all these polls and he reads what I read he sees all of this says, well hey they don't like that let's give them this and that's what they're doing socialism is very popular among the age 18 to 34 years old in America 
I uh, did some research. You can certainly have this if you'd like to have some of it after church. I don't have time. But I just want to read to you how America feels. According to Gallup polls taken last year, this is how America feels about socialism. A Gallup poll last year discovered that 43% of Americans say socialism would be a good thing for this nation. 43% like the idea. Among 18 to 34-year-old, 58%. Guess who's going to be preaching or who's going to be governing our nation in a few years? The 18 to 34-year-olds. 58% of them want socialism. Socialism is not good. 58% embrace the idea compared to 40% of those between the age of 35 and 54, and 36% of those 55 and older. It's gaining a lot of popularity, and it's showing in the polls. Is my preacher still helping? No, she's gone. It is showing in the polls. People are starting to vote. Right now, there's 101 social, Democratic Socialists, a DSA member, serving in the, in the Congress. And there's 87,000 Democratic Socialists right now actively working in every community in America. Among Democrats, contrast to 45% of independents and 13% of Republicans, 70% of Democrats say they are in favor of socialism. But when you ask the, average, the age 18 to 34, what's the definition of socialism, do you know what you get? Free, head, free health and free, ed, uh, free education. That is not socialism. Let me read what the definition of socialism is. Socialism defined as a political and economic theory which advocates that the means of production, distribution, and exchange should be regulated by the government. No personal property. Those of you that are sitting out there with keys in your pocket and a cell phone in your other pocket, personal property has to leave. Why will they pay for all of that? Uh, there's only 10 countries in the, in the world today that have a form of socialism slash capitalism because true socialism destroys a nation in just a little while. Look at Venezuela. But a socialism slash capitalism does work fair. But here's how it works. And I did look up all 10 countries and get their tax rate, and you can do that too. It's easy. And if you don't want to do that, I can give you a copy of this because I have it saved on my computer at home, and I don't mind. But all of the countries, let's just, it, the average is 57% of your check would be taken by the government. But if you lived in Sweden, it would be 61%. Now, the sales tax in Finland... After 56% tax, the sales tax is 24%. So that means when you spend a dollar, only, you only are able to buy 76 cents worth of stuff. The rest of it goes to taxes. But wait a minute, I'm already paying 57%. Now I'm paying 24% every time I spend a nickel. Are you getting the picture now? Are you putting things together now that we are seeing in our world? Are you seeing the, all of those things that are trying to happen? And I have, a, I have an entire paper on the dishonesty of real socialism. If you want to read that, I would be happy to give you a copy of that, or you can take my copy and, and make some copies. But those are the things that are going on in our world today. The first principle of socialism is no private property. No private property. We live under capitalism. Capital means property. It means you own stuff. And they're trying to tell us that it's evil. It's not evil to own your home, your own business, your stuff. It's not wrong to do that, but it, under that, it would be wrong to do that. That is what the, enemy, that's what the enemy is starting to do, and he's been doing it slowly by degrees for 240 years since our government was formed. He placed a long game, church. Something here to, to consider. Some things that we ought to consider. Communist countries have had, all of them have had genocide. Every communist country has had genocide. Genocide is killing people who are different from you. Different race, different religion, or different point of view. Different point of view. 
That may be interesting for us in light of what's going on. I don't want to get too political from the pulpit, so I'm not going to do that. But I'm concerned about that. Communism and socialism has killed 100 million people in its history. It's a lot of folks. What can we do? Let me tell you first what we cannot do. As long as we just sit and do nothing, the enemy is going to rule. What we cannot do is nothing. Isaiah uh, chapter 39, verse 1 through 8. I don't know if I'll have time to read all of those. I may just tell you the story. Isaiah the prophet comes to Hezekiah and tells him this. And I'm going to pick it up. Um, uh, well, go down to about the fifth verse, Tony, if you don't mind, and I'll just start there. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what fathers and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Now, something to remember, when this was written, Babylon was not a formidable nation. It was a fledgling trying to get on top of things. And it did get on top of things, and it took them into captivity. But listen, your houses and everything you've accumulated will be taken and shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Come on. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good, for he said, At least it won't happen in my lifetime. And that's what a lot are saying today. At least it won't happen in my lifetime. I'll be dead and gone before all this happens. So I don't care. Pass me another latte. <laughs> I don't care. That's what a lot of the American church, a lot of Christians are saying. At least it won't happen in my lifetime. There will be peace. It doesn't affect me as long as it does not affect me. That is the most selfish answer a father could ever give. A father gave that. He said, I don't care if my grandchildren and my children are sold into captivity to whatever nation. Babylon happened to be the going thing at that time. And I don't care as long as it doesn't happen in my time. Let me ask you a question. If you had a warning that the future would, in the future you would lose your house, your possession, and your children... What would you do? We are having that alarm sounded right now. If you would just see what's happening. Social media is good, but if you're only just finding out what your friend is taking their dog out somewhere or going shopping, you're not learning anything. Learn what is happening in our nation and see this dark prince that's rising out of darkness and he is beginning to over, overshadow our nation. And we cannot take Isaiah or Hezekiah's uh, idea. As long as it doesn't happen to me, I don't care. I'm going to draw my pension. I'm going to live my life, and I'm going to heaven, and you can have it. That is not what God wants us to do. We cannot say that. We cannot say that we don't care. Hezekiah seemed not to care. His words, at least, if it won't happen in my lifetime. That's a self-centered answer for a dad to give. But that's where America is today. We are pretty self-centered, and we're giving that answer. As long as it don't happen in my lifetime. I've had people, Christians, tell me, at least I won't live to see it. I'm not going to do anything about it either, because it's not going to affect me. I'm going to be dead and gone. I'm not going to remember my kids, my grandchildren, or anything else. I'm, I'm not. Church, I was born to fight her. I'll just be straight with you. I'm a natural-born door kicker. That's how I was born. I've been a door kicker all of my life. That's just who I am. I was that way in the Marine Corps. I was that way in growing up in sports. That's just what I am. 
I was born and bred to fight. I cannot sit down, lay down, and go away as long as this is happening. Whether we like it or not, Ephesians 6.12 says this. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, and a spiritual host of wickedness. We are dealing with those entities. In this nation, in your city, in your school, in your home. Ooh, somebody shout right now. <laughs> we may be dealing with all of this, but we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords who can stop it. In Genesis chapter 3, Adam abdicated his role as manager of creation and turned the world over to Satan, the God of this age. Now, let me tell you, the devil was kicked out of heaven before Adam was created. So let's get the story straight. We think it happened in the New Testament. It didn't. But the second Adam, Jesus Christ, came to solve that problem and return the power over the earth back to man. But you and I have to, to incorporate that. We have to appropriate that. We have to enforce that authority. And God only gave us one way to do it. And we need to take that way. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10. I love this verse of Scripture. Don't miss the last part. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. That's what's happening today. According to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him dwells all fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him who, listen to me, who is there, the who in that verse is Jesus. Jesus is the head of all principality. Don't worry. And power. Remember I talked about principalities and rulers and, a and hosts and all of that. The Bible says in Colossians that Jesus Christ is over all of that. And he also says you are complete in him. So you have an authority to, to be over the principalities in our age and in our time and in our communities and in our home. We have the authority to be over them. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the disciples were given power after the Holy Spirit came on them. Why? So they could deal with all that the princes would set up over this earth, over our cities, over the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, and I'll close with this in a few minutes. For though we walk in the flesh, I am so thankful for the authors who wrote the Bible who help us to be able to understand we can look in that and see what's happening. And if we'll do a little praying and seeking the Lord and a little research, God will help us understand that, hey, don't worry. Start praying. I'm over all the principality and all the power. I'm over that. We lose fact that Jesus is over that. Even in our own personal lives, we fall apart when we hit a little storm. Life is filled with storms. I mean, you know, God did give you the four seasons so you could kind of understand that. You have rain and sun and wind and snow and ice, and you have that in life too. You know, my philosophy is life is a mixture of freeways, back streets, and dirt roads. That's kind of how I live my life because that's, that's just what I see when I live life. Sometimes I'm doing 70. Sometimes I'm in a community dodging cars, and sometimes I'm on a, on a dirt road. And if you ain't ever been on a dirt road, I recommend you go find one <laughs> and drive down it at about 60. You'll hang on for dear life. And sometimes life is like that. We're driving on a freeway, side street, or a dirt road. We do not war according to flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of what the enemy has set up. Are you tired of it in your family, in your school, in all of those places? Well, I can tell you how we're not going to get that power to remove that stuff is by doing nothing. By saying, it's not in my life day, I don't care not going to affect me. Man, I got 13 grandkids and four or five great grandkids. I do not want to see them enslaved. 
It can never happen in America. That's what Israel said until Babylon carried them captive. Do you understand the, the debt that we have is, tw I think it's $27 trillion? That cannot be paid for in many lifetimes. You better hope the creditors don't call it due. Because that could kick loose a war that, whoo. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. We need to pull some stuff down in our nation. Casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. What can I do? Do what Jesus did. Do what the disciples did. Do what Daniel did. Do what we are instructed to do. Call on the name of the Lord. And what does the Bible say? I will answer. How many's read that? Amen. Call unto me in Jeremiah. Call unto me and I will answer you. And I'll show you stuff that will blow your mind. That's what that scripture says. Go read it. I'll show you stuff that will blow your mind. Some of us need to see some stuff that will blow our mind. How many of you have ever seen an absolute angel? How many seen an angel? There's a few of you here that seen angels. I absolutely seen one. Scared me half to death. And I tell you, I was in a wonderful place in a serene area when I saw him. I was mowing the grass. <laughs> Seriously, I was mowing the grass. I certainly wasn't in a God frame of mind. I can tell you that. I was using a push mower, not a riding mower. And the, and the yard was uphill and downhill and uphill and downhill. And I looked on my left, and there was a man in white linen walking beside me. Scared me to death. I thought it was a real person. I shut the mower off. I said, can I help you? And he turned and stepped right through the side of the building. Now, some of you don't believe that, and I don't care. I was the one there. I was the one that saw it. We need to see that. That'll convince you that, that it's real. I have been in a building when the Shekinah glory of God was thick. I've seen gross fall off of people's face in the floor. I've seen cancer heal. I've seen a lot of things happen. So nobody can tell me that all that stuff that I read in the Bible is not true. Because my grandmother was living proof. When she was in her 50s, she, was, she developed skin cancer, and skin cancer is bad. We worked in the fields back where I come from, out in the hot sun, chopping cotton and all that kind of stuff. Her, she got skin cancer on her face, and they'd eat half her nose up. Her face was black. She went to a Pentecostal church where there was people that spoke in tongues and believed in the Holy Ghost. They laid hands on her. She came back home. Her face was completely healed. There was no black. There was no nothing. She lived to be 93 years old, never dealt with cancer again in her life, and never went to another doctor. Died at 93 years old on no medication. Somebody broke her back by dropping her. That's what killed her. They gave her morphine, killed her like that. She never taken pain pills in her life. I never knew my grandmother to take so much as an aspirin. She just never was sick. So God is good. We need to begin to pray. I want to encourage you to pray together. I want to encourage you to join some of the prayer meetings. There's a prayer meeting here on Friday night, Saturday night. And if you want to meet with me, come out to my place. I got a nice room designed with heat. I'll even give you coffee. The thing is, it's 5 a.m. Don't be late. 5 a.m., you're welcome to come. I got a few more chairs in there, and you're welcome to sit. It, it won't disturb my family because we're out away. I got a room built just for calling on the name of the Lord. And you can come out and pray. Don't come out to talk. Come out to pray. We want to pray and talk to the Lord and get a hold of heaven. Now, before I give the altar call, I want to show you a couple of books that I think you ought to buy. And I don't usually do this, but can you give me the first book, Tony? Uh, can uh, you turn those lights off? I want to talk a little bit about this book. This is Reese Howe's Intercessor. You can buy that on Amazon. costs you about $4.98. Everybody should read this book. Everybody that's interested in knowing if God is still God. Now, I'm going to tell you something about this book. This book will mess with you. I gave this book to somebody to read. They gave it back and said, I cannot read this. There is no way I can read this book. I thought something was wrong with the book. It was, it was something wrong with the reader. The next book. You ought to read this. It's a good book. 
Um, you can't hardly see that. It's miracles in American history. It's 32 different times in the history of our nation where a divine intervention was caused that prevented us from losing the Revolutionary War. We should not have won that war. Sometimes 2,000 troops were fighting 60,000. We should not have won. But you got to remember what we were founded on, the principles of Jesus Christ. So when an oppressor came, God gave divine providence. Rivers would, auto, would just overnight rise, or the waters would drop, or a fog would come in on a clear day, and troops would be able to get across rivers. All kinds of things. You take that book and read it. It's a short read. It's not a fancy read, but it's a good read. 32 miracles in American history. I think it cost me nine bucks. We need to read stuff that help us to grow and to become, not just stuff that tells us how to get rich and how to get skinny and, you know, all of those things. I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not opposed to you reading those books. Read them if you must, but read some other stuff. Give me the lights back, please. Those books will help you as I begin to preach on the series, uh, Learning to Pray in the Holy Spirit. Um, the second book won't help you. Reese Howell's books will help you. It's a good book. I've read it so many times. Chris, would you come? I've read it about four times, and uh, it'll mess with your life uh, when you read it. Uh, if you don't have $4.98, see me, and I'll give you $4.98. And so you can get that book because it'll bless your life. Those of you that took my class on discipleship, you had to read that and report on it. Please read it again because we might have forgot something. And uh, I'm rereading it now just because for the fifth time because there's some great stuff in there, some great history, some great research, some great things that'll help you. Would you stand with me this morning? I am grateful to serve the Lord. I am grateful today that the Lord loves me. I am grateful that he saw fit to choose me. I did not get to choose him. He chose me. I know all of us think I chose Christ. No, he chose you. You just said yes. He chose you and ordained you and sent you forth that you can bring forth fruit. And today I encourage you that if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, that is something that you really need. You're going to need this. When you think about God and you think about all that's happening, don't think of just the context of our nation. Think of the context of the world. What is happening in the world, what is happening in America, what is happening in the large cities in America, what is happening in my city, and what is happening in my life. Ask what is happening in all of those places, and then ask that paramount question, what is causing this? Is it me because I'm not doing right? Or is it the enemy because I am doing right? If it's you, repent. If it's him, rebuke. Take care of business and move on. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord, that is a need you have. And if you'd like to accept him, invite him into your heart to be the Lord of your life, just simply uh, ask him to forgive your sins and to cleanse you. Is anybody in this room that would like to do that today? If anybody is watching us on this broadcast today, if you don't know the Lord and you want to accept him, I give you an invitation right where you're at to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, to ask him to come into your life and to forgive your sins. And if you do that, your sins will be forgiven. I hope that you will do that and let us know through mail or email. We'd be happy to hear from you. Let's pray, church. Father, we're so grateful today for your great mercy, for your tender kindness and the peace that you have brought to us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be a church that is awakened. Lord, don't help us sleep or slumber. Let us begin to be awakened by your presence. Let us call upon your name today with all that is within us. Let us give you praise and give you honor. In Jesus' name we pray. If you're here today and you need prayer, you'd like some of us to lay our hands on you and pray for you, if you would just come, we'd be honored to pray for you today. If not, uh, we want to receive our tithe and offering. Our tithing offering are right over here at the doors. You go out, just put in your tithe and your offering. If it is a tithe, please indicate that it's a tithe. If it's an offering, indicate that it is an offering. God bless you. We'll see you on Wednesday night.